Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 125 of the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast. I'm Christine. And I'm Sam. What have we been up to? I have on my outline, not much. Well, no, not much. See, we're in this time of year where I have to work a lot of weekend days. Yeah. And so we don't get the chance to really get out and about or, you know, go see and do a whole lot of things. Last week or so, yeah, really nothing going on. We did manage to have, um, if we're talking food, we did manage to have uh, some Mediterranean paninis Ooh, from yeah, we did. our local favorite. Upper Crust. Yeah. If you're ever in the Fredonia, New York area, be sure and stop at Upper Crust and get yourself the Mediterranean panini. Is there anything you need to tell them to take off? Yes. Just no cheese. Just no cheese. Yeah. So the uh, panini as presented. Yeah. Um, they do has... have vegan cheese if you want cheese. Yes. Yeah. But it's completely unnecessary. It, you d- it doesn't need it. Nope. So if you just take off the Asiago and provolone that come on it, uh-huh. and we always add avocado for a little bit of extra moisture. Creaminess. And creaminess. Yeah. yeah. It is fantastic. Yeah. So it's um, a thinly sliced and breaded. And pan fried in avocado oil. Yeah. Eggplant. Eggplant. And roasted red peppers uh-huh. and artichoke hearts. Artichoke hearts. Yeah. And all kinds Kalamata of Kalamata olives. Yeah. Just and, Mediterranean in your face. Oh, right? so in your face. Then on one on their homemade bread. Yep. We it's get like their, a multi grain. Yep. It's delicious. It is really a beautiful yeah, sandwich. It's a fantastic sandwich. So, so highly recommend. Yeah. And I have to say something that was super cool. Okay. Um, The reason I work so much in February and into March um, is because the department I work for, the Department of Theater and Dance Uh at Fredonia, we're doing auditions for our programs. So all of these, you know, students who are looking to be accepted into our performance programs and our theatrical production and design program are coming in to do their auditions and do their interviews and all of that stuff. And so anyway, I was wearing my favorite hoodie, which is my uh, Toronto pig save Mm -hmm. hoodie. And on the back, you know, it says save animals, bear witness, go vegan. Yeah. Um, Animalsavemovement.org. It's a great hoodie. It's a great hoodie. I love it. And so I was wearing that and I had not one, but two different parents from different families come and give me a hug because I'm vegan. Oh, no, really? So I met two vegan parents. Oh, that's fantastic. It was super cool. That's awesome. Yes. It was really, really great. Yeah, you didn't tell me that. That's really cool. And one of them, one of the families asked, you know, where do you go for lunch in Fredonia? Because their daughter had a later audition time. We had finished like a QA and a session, and, uh-huh. but their daughter had a later audition time. And I said, oh, well, you've got to go to Upper Crust. Yeah. And the dad looked at me and was like, I'm like, oh, yeah, vegan options. I wouldn't. I wouldn't steer you wrong. Yeah. And lots of vegan options in their baked goods, cookies yes. and scones. Cookies and, and scones. Yeah. And all those good things. Yeah. So that was super cool. Yeah. And you're right. I forgot to tell you about that. I'm yeah. Sorry. So I guess we did have some things to tell you about because on my outline, it says, what have we been up to? Not a whole heck of a lot moving on. <laughs> That's yeah. what it says she, on my Yes. She, very succinct <laughs> about it. She was. <laughs> yes. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on. All right. Let's do hey, it. Hey, we have a recipe this week. We do. We do. And it's a listener recipe. Woohoo! So this week's listener recipe comes to us from Jeff and Angela Carbone. Hey, fellow Italians, love it. (laughs) And we made their vegan cheese sauce because I love to make everybody's cheese sauce. If you have a cheese sauce recipe, send it to me because I love to dabble in cheese sauces. You do dabble in cheese sauces. Cheese is probably the thing outside of eggs, maybe, that Christine misses most and that I'm doing I, misses in air quotes that i missed most when we first went vegan right. yeah yeah and so anytime she gets the chance to make a cheese sauce or to make something that resembles eggs yeah like in. we made that quiche last oh, week oh that quiche was gorgeous though that was like three weeks ago now but that was gorgeous <laughs> it's, you know time just flies by see yeah was that really three weeks ago i think so holy cow mm. 
Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Anything that's like quiche or cheese sauces or cheese, vegan cheeses. Like if you have recipes for these things, send them. Right. And yes. I would also like to put in if you've got a good recipe for vegan cheese cake. Oh. Because I'm not a huge cheese person, but I did pre veganism love making cheesecake. Yeah, you Sam used to make a pretty killer cheesecake. Mm-hmm, I did yeah. back in the day, but I haven't really taken the time to learn to do it in a vegan way. No, you haven't. No, so yeah, I think I should do that. Well, you know, spring break's coming. It is. You have a little time on your hands. That sounds good. Yeah. So let's get back to the recipe. Jeff and Angela's cheese sauce. I made their cheese sauce, which let me tell you, it's all plants. It's all plant. There's mm-hmm. nothing fake in it at all um it's nut free which is great for people that don't don't uh like nuts or Or can't do nuts yeah or have allergies to nuts and we made i made a big plate of nachos and it's been a while since we've had nachos yeah can i say i love nachos like this was such a treat yesterday i know but i think Part of the reason why they're such a treat is because we don't have them very often. Oh, yeah. Not something I want to have every day, for sure. But yeah. it's not like a salad, you know, something I can eat every day. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's really a great treat. And the cheese sauce was fabulous. So it worked really perfectly on the nachos. It did. It was a really silky texture. Yeah. Gave nice moisture, good flavor profile. Yeah. Really loved it. And on top of the nachos, in addition to the cheese sauce, Christine did some vegan sour cream and we uh-huh. did some chorizo crumbles uh-huh. and lots of veg. So uh, tomatoes, uh, red tomatoes, onion, red onions, exactly. Uh, green, green onion. I love green onion yeah. on a nacho. Yeah, you got you got to top it with green onion. Mm-hmm. It's like the clincher. Now, and I would have done cilantro because I also like to you know da- a little dash of cilantro oh, on yeah. top. But my cilantro went bad. So oh no, yeah. And you were going to put guacamole, but you forgot. The I guacamole. forgot the guacamole, but it didn't need it. It didn't. Is that there was so sauce, much going all, on? Mm, yeah, it, was it was scrumptious, great. just scrumptious. So that didn't use very much of the cheese sauce up. No, and the recipe made. A lot. It makes quite a bit. Of cheese sauce. Yeah. And Jeff and Angela did say that it keeps, it'll keep in the refrigerator for like four to five days and you can freeze it. And what they usually do is just pull it out like earlier in the morning or the day before to let it thaw in the fridge. Okay. And uh, then just warm it up in a pan or even in the microwave if you want. Mm-hmm. And then you, if if it's still if it's still a little stiff, because sometimes the vegan cheese sauces that you make, they'll stiffen up sure. in the refrigerator. You can add a little plant milk mm-hmm. to it. Stir that in while you're warming it up. Anyway, so that's what I did. Today, I took what was left, zhuzhed it up a little bit, and I added a little plant milk. And I made a mac and cheese. Yes. And it was so sweet of her. Whenever Christine says she's going to make something along those lines, particularly mac and cheese, I will immediately ask, can you put broccoli in that? Sam always asks, can, no matter what I'm making, can you put broccoli in that? What can I say? <laughs> I love broccoli. And come on, we got to get our crucifers. Oh, yeah. No, I had no problem. So, yeah. So I also cooked up a little bit of broccoli and added that into the mix. And it turned out fantastically it was great yeah i spiced it up a little bit i put a little bit of smoked paprika for a little bit of a smoky flavor and i added the brine from some pickled jalapeno Mm -hmm. just to give it a little zing and it it was zingy yeah there was just a little bit of heat underneath it it was really nice turned out really good so this recipe is super versatile you know it is I would highly recommend. Yeah, totally rec- highly recommend. And thank you, Jeff and Angela, for sending this recipe along. We're going to share the recipe. Hopefully I can fit it into the show notes. If I can't fit it into the show notes, I will definitely share it across our social media for you if you'd like to try and make it yourself. Sounds good. And now on to this week's noteworthy section. GOP speechwriter Matthew Scully writes about animal protection from an unlikely place, the political right. Yeah. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. It is a surprise. It really is. You don't often think of right-wing politicians as being pro-animal rights. You do not. No. So uh, we have a little bit of an article here from Deseret News uh, that we'd like to share with you. Matthew Scully has crafted soul-stirring speeches for a constellation of GOP stars 
George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Sarah Palin, and Mike Pence among them. He has been called by his longtime speechwriting partner, John McConnell, as good a writer as has ever written for a president, just a superior talent. But for the past 20 years, some of the most moving words that Scully has composed have been about dogs, cows, and pigs. The Arizona resident began a shadow career as an advocate for animals in the 1990s. Later, as he wrote speeches for policymakers and presidents in his day jobs, Scully labored nights and weekends on what would become one of the most important books in the animal rights movement, Dominion, published in 2002. It was his only book until he published Fear Factories in December. Fear Factories is a compilation of articles and essays Scully wrote between 1993 and 2023, the bulk of which appeared in National Review, a flagship journal of conservatism. This is just blowing my mind. It is. I have read Dominion. Yeah, how, did, how did I not put this together that the author of Dominion was a GOP speechwriter? I didn't put it together either. That's crazy. No clue. It was, he admits, an unlikely venue for the sort of advocacy that Scully engages in. Animal protection is widely seen as an issue of the left, to the point where some people see a meat culture war in American society. To some conservatives, my essays were time-wasting nonsense, vegan propaganda, belonging in leftist publications, and so on, Scully writes in Fear Factories. That sort of disdain is still often seen on the political right. Former GOP presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy was mocked on social media for being vegetarian, especially because he says he doesn't eat meat for moral reasons. God forbid our politicians have morals and ethics. Seriously. You know? Oh, my God. One would hope. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a picture here of a a tweet that says Vivek didn't realize that Republicans would never vote for a vegetarian. Yeah. Crazy. So in order to be a Republican, you can't be a vegetarian? No, because that's too leftist, you know? That's too woke. That's too woke, as the kids say now. Okay. Morality, however, is central to the arguments that Scully, 64, makes when he condemns factory farming, trophy hunting, and other practices that cause animals to suffer. We humans deplore cruelty, and yet we tolerate it on a horrific scale, he says. He connects being pro-life with being pro-animal, writing... I first learned about the abortion rights cause and about the ruthlessness of industrialized farming around the same time, at the age of 13 or 14. And my reaction to both was similar. You just don't treat life that way. The youngest son in a family with three daughters and three sons, Scully told me that he lived in multiple states growing up, including New York, Colorado, and Ohio. His moral awakening came at the behest of a dog, a golden brown stray that his parents led into their home in Casper, Wyoming, on a snowy night when Scully was just a toddler. He became so attached to the dog, named Lucky, and the dog equally attached to him, that as Lucky neared the end of his life, Scully would sometimes cancel plans in order to stay home with his canine friend. It was that relationship that caused Scully to think deeply about the moral incongruity of how our society treats animals— welcoming some into our homes and directly causing or ignoring the mistreatment of others. Sometimes it takes a dog to help us think straight, he wrote in the essay Lessons from a Dog, first published in National Review. In this case, the lesson was moral coherence. Scully announced at age 15 that he would no longer eat meat and says that his conservative Republican National Review subscribing parents respected his decision. My mother even went out in search of new sustenance for me, returning with every faux meat alternative that grocery stores in 1974 had to offer. Yeah, that would have been Boca Burgers and Tofu. That that was pretty much all you had back then. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, not that I would remember. 1974. That's when you were born. That's right. I wasn't around for most of it. (laughs) Anyway. 
After high school, he went to Arizona State University, where he wrote editorials for the school newspaper that John O'Sullivan, an editor at National Review, came across. O'Sullivan became a mentor of sorts. Scully calls him a patron, which led to Scully becoming the assistant literary editor and then the literary editor of National Review, which would lead to still more opportunities in Washington, D.C. and beyond, he wrote in the acknowledgments of Fear Factories. Those opportunities included writing speeches for Vice President Dan Quayle and Pennsylvania Governor Bob Casey. He was later hired by the George W. Bush campaign in 1999 and would work for President Bush for about five years, including a period of especially important speeches right after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Interesting. Can you imagine writing speeches for um, for Quayle, for Dan Quayle? No, I can't. <laughs> and then like cringing the whole time he probably butchered I, your I, speech. I cannot imagine. <laughs> Oh. That is beyond my imagination. Yeah. For all his professional success as a speechwriter and his fame in animal protection circles, Scully is virtually a ghost on the internet, save for his own bylined articles. He has no website or social media presence other than people mentioning his name. He gave interviews when Dominion was published, including one with the Washington Post, in which he shut down rumors that he was fired by the White House for writing the book. He and his wife, Emmanuel, a trilingual violinist and artist, stay out of the headlines, concentrating on their work and raising their teenage twin sons. All four are vegans. But what Scully lacks in self-promotion, he makes up for in relationships, many of which were born of his animal advocacy. There is, for example, the couple whose relationship was facilitated in part by one of Scully's articles in National Review. After the New York Times published an article about the couple's marriage, Scully reached out to Josh Leugman and Anne Porter Leugman, and they developed a friendship to the point where Scully mentions them in his new book. Josh Leugman, an attorney who lives in Northern Virginia, told me, it appears to be the case that he becomes a friend of everyone with whom he speaks, and I would also say a very loyal one. Do you think that Josh Lyman on the West Wing was named after Josh Loyman. I don't know. We were watching The West Wing, and um, I, I don't know. It just occurred to me. Just a matter of moments ago, yeah. actually. Yeah. We'd have to ask Aaron Sorkin. Yeah. I, I'm going to write him a letter. Excellent. In the Times article, headlined, Conservative and a Vegan in New York, wait, you are too? Anne Porter Loyman talked about how Scully's essay on the parallels of being pro-life and pro-animal helped her to move from being a vegetarian to a vegan. I couldn't believe how inconsistent my belief systems were prior to reading the article, she told the Times. Others tell similar stories of how reading a single essay or chapter of Scully's work changed a person's eating habits on the spot. Obviously, he has a gift. His writing is so powerful. His pig chapter in Dominion, it is called Deliver Me From My Necessities. I told my then 27-year-old son about it, and he went vegan after reading that. That's how powerful the book is, said Amanda Upshaw, who first read Dominion three years ago and has since named her farm animal sanctuary in Fairhope, Alabama, after the book. In the chapter that Upshaw mentioned, Scully describes hog farms that he visited in North Carolina, where up to 600 hogs were encased in iron crates in which they could not turn around. Gestational crates, though ones in the Netherlands, are pictured on the cover of Scully's new book. Upshaw told me she has bought 10 copies and intends to buy more to give to friends. This is not to say that Scully converts everyone who encounters his work. As he admits, many intelligent and ethical people disagree with his conclusions, and Scully has been accused of being unduly emotional in his arguments. Even though Dominion is deeply researched, it retains a speechwriter's flair, as when Scully wrote about the bright, sensitive pig dangling by a rear hoof as he or she is processed along, squealing in horror. The veal calf, taken from his mother, tethered and locked away in a tiny dark stall for all of his brief, wretched existence. If you could walk all of humanity through one of these places, 90% would never touch meat again. I agree. I do, too. But even his critics underestimated the lasting influence of Dominion. 
One reviewer, Wesley J. Smith, a critic of the extremes of the animal rights movement, added a postscript to his remarks on the book in the journal First Things, writing four years later. Scully's book had a greater impact than I thought it would back in 2002 when my review was written, but I think my criticism remains apt. Scully's critics include those who say he does not go far enough in defense of animals, and those say there are inconsistencies in his thinking. But the biggest pushback appears to be a segment of conservatives who believe this sort of thinking does not fit with what they see as conservative and even religious principles, and that animal issues don't, as he wrote, warrant the attention of serious people. The tension between Scully's animal advocacy and the disparate beliefs of many of those in the GOP was perhaps best illustrated in 2008 when he wrote a speech for Sarah Palin, a sport hunter, raising eyebrows at The Atlantic and Time magazine. But it's that incongruity, perhaps, that makes Scully such a powerful voice for animal welfare— No other person speaking out against the exploitation of animals today has such a regal pedigree within the GOP. There are very few people who have the bona fides, the background, to end up in the publications that he's ended up in, Loyman said. It's fair to say that only someone with the background that he has, coupled with the writing ability he has, could result in people considering things that they would not have come to consider if not for him. As for Scully, he wants people of all political persuasions to spend more time thinking, calling for honest reasoning, a careful weighing of choices, and some sensible moral dot connecting. In short, as he writes, work up some moral energy and think. Yeah, we should all work up some moral energy and think. (laughs) Always. Yeah. About everything. And I can't imagine how difficult his job must be writing speeches for the right Mm -hmm. Because if he's writing speeches for people like Sarah Palin, they're definitely, you know, pandering to the animal agriculture industry. Frequently, yes. And frequently in their speeches, they they talk about their support for -hmm. those industries. And um, I just wonder how how he deals with that, you know? Yeah. I'm sure it's not easy. I'm sure it's not. But honestly, this article has made me want to immediately pick up Dominion again. Yeah. And his new book. And his new book. Yes, that's going to be an essential. I'm going to go look for that as soon as we are done podcasting this evening. Because I want to read it again, knowing that this is a politically conservative human who is writing it. And it also gives me, honestly, a bit of hope. Yeah. Well, he was certainly raised right. You know, his parents, even though they were very far right leaning, Mm -hmm. appreciated and and supported him in his journey to not eat animals. And I think that's really cool. And I guess it kind of, in my mind, kind of falls under that category where it's like not judging people for what they do for a living. Right. For what they have to do for money. Yeah. Because behind that is... Might, it's not who you think it is, right. right? It's not always who you think it is. Well, and also not making assumptions about people based on their political affiliations or their political leanings or right. whatever that is. Yeah, we could all use a little more of that, right? Yeah. Especially definitely. in this climate. For sure. That we don't judge people uh, immediately based on their political affiliations and, right. and all that stuff uh, to look deeper. That's right. Yeah. We What? We are both registered Democrats, the only reason I can tell you for absolute certain, the only reason I am registered as a Democrat is so I can vote in primaries. Yeah. You know, yeah. if if there was something further left, <laughs> if, there were right. like, if, you know, green or green socialist yeah. or anything along those lines yeah. was viable, yeah. that's where I would be. In Canada, they have the uh, Animal Protection, protection Party. Party. Yeah, and that's exactly where I would and be if we were Canadian. Where we would be if we were Canadian. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so that's really cool. Um, I'll put a link to that article in the show notes if you'd like to peruse it yourself. And also links to both of Matthew Scully's books, uh, Dominion and Fear Factories. That brings us to our main topic. It certainly does. 
This week's main topic is when vegan businesses abandon us and their ethics. Yes. So just to give you a little bit of context, okay, recently a vegan food vendor and restaurateur in the Buffalo area released a press release. And the press release stated, We want to make the announcement that our restaurant and catering menu will be transitioning to a whole foods menu, inclusive of our ever popular plant based menu. We felt the time was right to become more all inclusive, especially with the demand of our first brick and mortar and the very diverse and unique nutritional needs of all our current customers and new customers as well. We will always be health focused and quality focused first and foremost. Our line of retail sauces will continue to be made for all, with the core value of being dairy free, GMO free, and gluten-free. Our summer vending division will further remain as is, with additional new plant-based creations coming for this summer of 2024. But we are expanding our food empire and allowing life and our culinary creations to take us where they are directed. We truly want to be the best food company for everyone. All that said, We are very excited to offer many of our new creations in our wraps, panini, salads, and bowls that now include organic, high-quality, hormone-free, and antibiotic-free chicken, along with wild-caught salmon, shrimp, and blue crab. We have also added artisan cheeses, such as high-quality feta, goat, blue cheese, imported Italian Parmesan, and sharp cheddars to our restaurant and catering menu, alongside our array of high-quality plant-based alternatives as well. Our catering menu is also inclusive of grass-fed steaks, wild-caught seafood, and Bell & Evans hormone-free organic chicken. We have recently partnered with Box Buffalo to fill an additional need to offer active and health-conscious gym members the opportunity to customize meal plans. We will offer a range of culinary creations, including organic meats, plant-based, and gluten-free options. Plans will be customizable based on budget, food preference, and lifestyle. We are priced on the premium side due to the high-quality ingredients we use. Yeah, we're not going to call out this restaurateur. If you're in the Buffalo area, you probably know. Chances are you know. There's been a lot of talk over the last few days. Who we're talking about. That list of animals he's now serving, just, it was never ending. It's appalling. Yeah. It was absolutely appalling. It was just never ending. Now, here's why, one of the reasons why the vegan community in the Buffalo area was so appalled, shocked, disappointed, and eventually angered Mm -hmm. by this press release. This restaurant and food vendor started out as a vegan food vendor. Yes, 100% plant-based. Yeah. Somebody shared this press release in a vegan group on Facebook. And, of course, people were appalled and they were voicing that opinion in many, many comments. Uh, I think the post got, like, close to 300 comments. Mm -hmm. And the owner of this establishment Defended and defended and defended and to the point where he was starting to be rude yes. to, to some of the people commenting and continually said they were never a vegan restaurant. It was never their intention to be a vegan restaurant, that this was always their intention from the beginning to serve animal products and that all of this is to aid in in supporting their animal rights group that they have. They have an animal rights organization. Yes. Uh, So it just gets worse and worse, right? It does. Now, there are a lot of things in this press release that I would like to pick apart. Okay. And I'm going to start from the beginning. So number one, they state that they are transitioning into a whole foods menu. If you ask me, meat of any kind cannot be considered a whole food. No. It was whole when it was an animal. It was whole when it was an animal. Yeah. It has been processed. 
Uh, your average hamburger comes from the meat of over 100 cows. That's correct. So how is that a whole food? That's right. So I really think that their assertion that they are transitioning to a whole food menu is just flatly wrong. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Now they're talking about um, becoming more inclusive. Yeah, the inclusive point. Right. Okay. Which I think is is very, very interesting, um, talking about the diverse and unique nutritional needs of all customers. Now, I will agree that every human body does have unique nutritional needs. Sure. There are certain things that are consistent among humans in general. Absolutely. But everybody's needs are slightly different. I won't argue that. Yeah. But can we please acknowledge the fact that animal flesh is not nutritionally necessary. No, it absolutely isn't. And vegan food is inclusive, barring any sort of food allergies. That's right. Right? Yes. So vegan food is doesn't automatically... Get more inclusive. It doesn't. Okay. Anything that is vegan, again, as Christine said, barring a food allergy, is already inclusive. He tried to say, I don't understand. There's often restaurants that post in this group that offer vegan options. They're omnivore restaurants that offer vegan options. And he could not wrap his brain around the fact that the vegan community has supported this this operation from the beginning. Because they were fully vegan. Because they were a fully vegan restaurant and food vendor. Right. Now, they recently moved from vending on location, like via kind of, of a pop-up, kind of a food truck situation to a brick and mortar. Now, the vegan community in Buffalo came out in hordes to support this guy's brick and mortar. Yes. They bought loyalty cards. Yes. They bought gift certificates. Yes. They did all these things to support this guy when he opened this brick and mortar. And then he drops this bomb. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of angry people out there with gift cards and loyalty cards and gift certificates in their hand going, what do I do with this? Right. And if I were them, I would be asking for them to be refunded. Absolutely. And I would hope that he would refund their money. I would hope so. Yeah. I'm assuming that there will probably be some resistance to that. Yeah, but they because were bought the under, argument, yes, they I'm were, sorry, they bought were, under false pretenses. Yeah. To a certain degree, yes. They were bought when the operation was still fully vegan and it is no longer. So the argument from the proprietor might be, well, what's your problem? I still have the vegan options. Right. And that's what he was saying. I yes. still carry my full vegan menu. You can still get all the vegan foods that we sold. But a lot of these people wouldn't have supported him if they'd known this was going to happen. Right. You know? I mean, the thing is, what I've noticed about vegan communities in general is that Sure, we are happy when an omnivore establishment creates vegan options. Yeah. That's great. And we want to support that yeah. because we hope that it will encourage them to create more vegan options. Sure. To have their menu come a little bit closer, you know, even if it's by baby steps yeah. to a vegan or plant-based menu. Yeah, and that's what one of the commenters pointed out. When he was trying to defend himself by saying, look, you let other restaurants post in this group, no problem at all. And everybody's happy that they're, you know, telling you what their vegan options are. And this person said, yes, but what you don't understand, it's not the same. When an omnivore restaurant comes on here and says they have vegan options, we look at that as progress. Yes. You're moving backwards. That's correct. So that's the difference. It is the you difference. You know? Yes. The big difference is that here is a organization an establishment that we all perceived as being vegan. Yeah. And now it's being said, nope, fooled you. Yeah, no, we weren't. We, we were never vegan. We were never vegan. Well, I'm telling you, all of the vegans in this group, they <laughs> kept receipts. And, I, and, and one of them pointed directly to his, it looks like his about page on Facebook. And it says the first company to make meatless food mainstream through event vending, catering, and a retail line of sauces and spices designed for the masses. Unequivocally vegan, without having to say it. Right. Okay? Because people would often say, are they vegan? Because they never had any kind of signage that mm -hmm. said they were vegan. It all just kind of screams deceit. Yes. You know? But, right. but in many instances, 
they have said that they're vegan, mm-hmm. that their food is vegan. Oh, and so it's not that he's afraid. He was afraid to say the word then. He's just afraid to say it now. That's right. A couple of other things in the press release that bother me a little bit. So he talks about their line of retail sauces continuing to be made, quote unquote, for all with a core value of being dairy free, GMO free and gluten free. Well, what does it matter if your sauces are dairy free if you are bringing in eight types of cheeses to your menu? Yeah. Um, The sauces don't so much seem to matter anymore. No, um, they the don't. Cheese it doesn't balance the it out. Largest, the largest thing, and what I find interesting is that after listing the ridiculous number of animals that they are going to be sourcing um, yeah. for their new recipes, he starts referring to these plant-based dishes as alternatives. Right. It's like a huge shift, right? Yes. It's like now our menu is going to be primarily animal based, but yeah. we will still have plant based alternatives. alternatives. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's just it, it's really disingenuous. And one yeah. of the things that I found probably most disturbing was um I mean, anybody who listens to us knows I don't social media. I I think social media is one of the great evils of society <laughs> and I I don't do it. Yeah. But, you know, Christine does. And you know, she told me about uh, a statement that he made that was literally admitting that he was using the vegan community yeah, he said as a stepping stone. That was their plan all along, to start out as a vegan food eatery mm-hmm. to support their their animal rights. I can't even say it. Oh, to no, we're going to get to that. Yeah. And that they had planned on, as they grew the business, on the backs of all their vegan patrons... That they were going to start introducing meat and dairy. Yes. He admitted it. Yes, he did. That was his plan all along. And he seemed to think there was nothing wrong with that. So he, he's completely, it's completely going over his head that all of these people that have supported his business all these years feel betrayed. Yes. You know? Yes. And um, let's get to the animal rights organization. So apparently this company has their very own animal rights organization, they do. which I find really, really hard to believe it's right now. a little odd. It is. And they have donated, um, from what I read, upwards of $100,000 of their profits yeah. to this organization. Now, that can be seen as commendable. I, I, you know, you donate $100,000 to an animal rights org. Sure. But here's the thing. It's only dogs and cats. It's dogs and cats. And uh, yeah, a sanctuary owner in the area posted, look, we get it. You love dogs and cats, but you Mm -hmm. don't love animals and you can stop saying that you do. Yes. Uh, Somebody pulled a post out. Like I said, the vegans keep receipts. (laughs) Somebody pulled a post (laughs) out from uh, 2021. Hey, guys, our vegan food company, we won't say the name, no. is excited to announce the return, our return to Buffalo this summer. And then further down in the post, he says, and don't forget, all we do goes directly to benefit our animal rights organization. Yeah, that's not an animal rights organization. And the thing is, by now including animals in your recipes, in your menu... You are now ensuring the imprisonment, torture, and death of, of animals. Of hundreds and thousands hundreds, of animals. Thousands yeah. Yeah. of animals. And, okay, so he mentions that his fancy chicken comes from Bell and Evans hormone-free organic chicken. Yeah, so Bell and Evans has been touted as one of the most humane chicken processing facilities i don't think you can put humane and processing in the same sentence but no and they also have let me tell you this bell and evans have fantastic seo people because no matter how many times you type in problems with bell and evans or this and bell and evans nothing comes up Mm -hmm. except statements that they've made about how great their facility is oh wow yeah i did find one thing from animal outlook where they found cruelty inside of their hatchery. Okay. And it's a article about a film that was made within their hatchery of chicks being macerated. Of course. And 
we know that this goes on in almost all hatcheries. Yes. It's not unusual. This is standard practice. But Bell and Evans would never admit that anything like this goes on because apparently they've got some kind of chicken paradise going on over there at Bell and Evans. (laughs) Insanity. Our our point here is not to attempt to get anyone to stop patronizing this particular business. That's, Obviously, we haven't even given you the name. Everyone's personal choice. That's right. To like support said, or if, not support. If, if you're in Buffalo, you probably know. And if you're not in Buffalo, you don't need to. Yeah. We, we don't want to create ill will. No, um, absolutely By not. any stretch of the imagination. Nope. Just to, you know, kind of express our own consternation at, yeah. this, at this flip. And just confusion. At, yes. And especially about the fact that they don't seem to see why people were upset about it. Yeah. I don't understand. He kept saying, I don't understand why you're all so upset about it when other restaurants can post there. It's like, dude, dude, how can you not see? Well, right. But again, we just go back to number one, those omnivore restaurants are being upfront about right. what they are from right. the very, very beginning. Right. And those steps towards vegan options, the addition of vegan options, that's progress. Right. Um, that's not like recession. Yeah. And this in he also stated that this is not a financial move. Right. Because people asked, is it because you're in trouble? Because if you're in trouble, you should reach out to, you know, the community and let us know you're in trouble. The vegan community in this area is, I mean, they will act when things need to happen. But he insists that it was not a financial move on their part, that this was their plan all along. Yes. So, wow. I don't know. I don't even know what else to say about it. It, It's so aggravating. It really is. You know. Yep. To think that um, it's just, I can't understand how he does not see the support that he has gotten over the, I think they've been going for maybe four years. I'm not sure. The support that they've gotten from the vegan community in Western New York and Central New York, it's just, he doesn't seem to care about it at all. Well, and I I think he's going to find that he's going to lose that section of his customer base. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't know. And uh, I don't want to wish anybody ill will or anything. Of course not. But I hope he does notice the difference, you know. And he said he still plans on running his vendor business over the summer for veg fests and stuff like that i'll be really curious to see how many people come out and support him given all this you Mm -hmm. know should be interesting we shall see yeah but that led me to kind of dig and it was so funny because shortly after this happened i was fed an article about a restaurant in the uk a fully vegan restaurant that is now adding meat to their menu But they plainly say that it was financial struggles and that they were having a problem paying their people. Right. So there was an article in the uh, Daily Mail. Yes. Uh, Cameron Roy, uh, this was published on the 31st of January, so just last week. A vegan restaurant has been forced to start serving meat because it has too few vegan customers. Adonis Narusnia says he made the decision to change Nomas Gastrobar's menu after too many customers would come to the restaurant only to leave once they read the vegan-only menu. Meat alternatives have been added to the mainly vegan selection of the restaurant in Macclesfield, Cheshire, with the aim to improve profits. But the decision has caused an angry backlash from vegans who have messaged the owner and vowed not to visit. Mr. Narusnia, who is also vegan, said he was forced to make the decision to pay his staff's wages and has criticized the astonishing amount of nasty comments he has received. The company said it had previously explored several options which would allow it to remain open. It said it kept their drinks prices the same amidst the cost of living crisis while also trying a variety of money-saving deals. But these steps did not help, and it said the meat introduction was needed to help them pay for staff wages and rent. Although the menu remains mainly vegan, the company said it has brought in the meat options for those who want them. We understand that our decision to start serving meat on our menu may come as quite a shock to people. It certainly did to us. However, daily, we witness people walking into Nomas Gastro Bar, seeing the menu, and then walking out. Or even saying, is it all vegan? And then leaving. 
Mr. Naruznia also said some customers refused to pay for full English breakfasts after being surprised the bacon and sausages were plant-based. So they will now be adding pork sausages, bacon, and eggs, as well as serving pork and chicken gyros and beef burgers in the coming weeks. Yeah, so I don't know if this is just a case of bad marketing as far as their vegan restaurant went. <laughs> if people didn't know it was a vegan restaurant, you know what I mean? Yeah. If he had people sitting down for meals unaware that they were sitting in a vegan restaurant, it could be a case where it, it's bad marketing. And it tells me that if omnivores were going in there not knowing it was a vegan restaurant, that vegans didn't know it was a vegan restaurant, right? I mean, right. it would just seem that way. So I don't know if this is a case of just bad marketing and bad business practices or what, but at least they're honest that it's all about the money and that they're having a hard time paying their employees and they didn't want to shut the doors. At least they're honest. I would hope that uh, uh, they would reconsider once they're back on their feet and uh, stop serving cruelty. I certainly hope so. Yeah. I certainly hope so. Yeah, it's been uh, interesting. Uh, it's been an interesting week with all this going on, and it's made me really think and appreciate the fully vegan options that we have in our area. Absolutely, and I, I got to tell you that there's a new one. Well, there's that. We'll get to that. But I got to tell you that the community in this area came out so strong, full force, so strong. Everybody was out at all the fully vegan establishments this week, and. Posting and supporting and That's posting right. pictures of their food. Strong Hearts in Buffalo made their own press release <laughs> and just good. said, we'd just like everybody to know that we are still 100% vegan and yeah. will always be yeah. 100% Fully vegan, vegan. Always have been. Yes. Always will be. Yeah. And uh, I appreciated that on their, you know, a little tongue in cheek on yeah. their behalf. But that was great. And we have a new establishment. We do. But we just want to shout out our, you know, our favorite Buffalo, like the cornerstones of the Buffalo vegan restaurant community. We've got, of course, Strong Hearts Buffalo. We've got Good and Evil. We've got Sunshine Vegan Eats. And now we have Balanced Bite. The Balanced Bite. Thank you. You're I was very racking my brain and it, for some reason it like left my brain. They're doing vegan breakfasts and lunch foods and they're open Friday and Saturday for that with uh, seating. They have seating. Mm -hmm. And then during the week, they do prepared meals that you can order ahead and go and pick up if you, you know, don't want to cook. They have all these really great, fantastic, healthy, whole food, vegan meals that you can pick up. Their breakfasts that people were posting, they looked fantastic. They really did. Yeah. And, you know, we weren't able to get up there this weekend because of, you know, my work schedule. But as yeah. soon as that lightens up, we will be heading up to Balanced Bite on a Saturday morning. Very, very soon. Yeah. So I just encourage everyone out there to support the 100% vegan, not just restaurants. We also have the vegan grocery store here. Absolutely. Any 100% vegan organization that you can patron, mm -hmm. please do. Give them all the support that you can. Uh, it's it's a tough world out there for for people to make it, for small businesses to make it. And we really need to support the people that are aligning with our ethics mm -hmm. and that are standing by their own. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well said, Pookie. Oh, thank you. Is that the first time I've called you Pookie on the show? <laughs> no. Okay, good. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Did I really do that? <laughs> you have done it in the past. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Hey, that brings us to our helpful fact. What is our helpful fact to encourage you to go vegan and stay vegan? I wouldn't call this a helpful fact. I would call this a helpful tip. Yeah, okay. A tip. Yeah. So this week's tip is to not get stuck in your old habits and conveniences when eating out. So sometimes, and we all know that this is true, laziness can get the better of us. I certainly remember pre-veganism, uh, our standard meal was what we then thought of as a protein and then a starch of some time, either pasta or rice or potatoes, and sure. then a vegetable. Sure. Yes. And I know a lot of people who eat that way and there's, you know, you just, you can get into a rut with that. Oh yeah, you can. But sometimes laziness gets the better of us. And before you know it, one choice leads to eating the same thing two nights in a row or just kind of having a sandwich or, you know, not really getting the most out of your food. The best way to combat this is to plan. So think of all of the places that offer vegan options for lunch during your lunch break or pack in advance. 
If you're looking for somewhere to eat out, apps like Happy Cow and A Billion Veg are lifesavers if you're stuck for ideas or aren't familiar with the area. If you struggle with food in general or you're a little bit particular, ask any cafe or restaurant to make something off the menu. Most places are happy to do so if they get notice or if you request ingredients to be put together that they already have in other dishes. Once you get more experience and educate yourself on the abundance of vegan-friendly foods available, it will be much easier to make good choices. That brings us to our favorite part of the show. Must be listener shout-out time. You know it! It's listener shout-out. Just want to give a shout-out to all my fans watching. I love you guys. I love you. This week's listener shout-out goes to the one, the only, Crystal Allen. Crystal is a mom, a vegan, a caretaker, and an amazing home cook and baker. All I have to say is probably the best lemon blueberry cake I have ever had. And right next to that, Crystal, what did you do to those cranberries? (laughs) Thanks for listening, Crystal. We love you so much and are so sorry it took us so long to give you a shout out. (laughs) It was brought to my attention that we hadn't shouted you out by... Someone who will remain nameless. My friend. I could have swore we shouted you out. And I think I just got confused in my head because we had talked about you um, because you gave us that cake. Mm -hmm. And we talked about you with a recipe Mm -hmm. and, oh, and your Yule log. And and And, and the spinach uh, artichoke dip. And now Crystal has been dabbling in sourdough. And she's just every day, every day. I don't know when she finds time. Every day. New loaves of sourdough. Sourdough bagels. Sourdough (gasps) sourdough crackers. Like, like she's just gone bonkers on sourdough. Okay, I need a sourdough bagel. I know. Like, are you kidding me with that? I know. Okay. Right? Wow. Anyway, contact us with your t-shirt size and address, Crystal, so we can send you a Compassion and Cucumber swag bag. You can either email us at CompassionandCucumbers at gmail.com or drop me a DM on Instagram or Facebook. For the rest of you out there, if you want a listener shout out, please email or DM us. Let us know what you think of the show and tell us just a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Do that. Hey, it's time for our vegan org of the week. And this week we are celebrating the Humane Farming Association. We are. For well over three decades, HFA has led the charge against farm animal abuse and the very real dangers factory farming pose to our health and to our environment. From groundbreaking legislation, anti-cruelty investigations and prosecutions, legal action, and direct care for abused animals, your support enables them to ensure that farm animals receive the care and legal protection they so desperately need and deserve. These are just some of the reasons the Humane Farming Association is known as the nation's most effective and credible farm animal protection organization. The Humane Farming Association is dedicated to the protection of farm animals. Founded in 1985 and over 270,000 members strong, HFA has garnered worldwide recognition and respect for its landmark anti-cruelty campaigns, including, most notably, its successful national veal boycott. HFA is particularly well known for its unparalleled track record of credibility, accuracy, and integrity in addressing legislative issues pertaining to farm animals. With an unyielding focus on combating the imprisonment of animals in cages and crates, HFA initiated the nation's first major TV, radio, and print media campaign exposing farm animal abuses and, among other initiatives, introduced the very first state and federal legislation in the United States targeting factory farm confinement. HFA's hard-hitting principled campaigns against factory farming highlight the real-world effect of maintaining integrity and core values while pursuing animal protection. To learn more about their work and to support them, go to hfa.org. They're a great organization. They do kind of bring up their website, for me, kind of brings up the argument of uh, welfare versus liberation. Sure. But... I mean, somebody's got to do the work on both sides, right? Oh, yes. The work needs to be done on both sides. Yeah. I think knowing that liberation is not going to happen overnight. Right. I think it's important that welfare be considered also. Yeah, the absolutely. Two, the two sides of the argument shouldn't be mutually exclusive. I don't think so either. I think the movement in general will be more successful if there's collaboration there. Yeah, I, I agree totally with that. Well, wow. We're at an hour already. That's nothing new. I guess it's time to wrap this baby up. It must be. I just have a couple of calls to action for you. Really? That's yeah. new. Just a couple. As usual, 
We encourage you to join the AFA Vegan Voter Hub, and the link is always in our show notes. We also encourage you to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. And we're encouraging you to send us your favorite vegan recipes for our listener recipe series so we can try them and talk about them on the show. We do love doing that. Yeah. And with that, it's time to sign off. You have just listened to episode 125 of the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast, and there's nothing left to say but where cukes and compassion are always the fashion. On On the the podcast. podcast. (laughs) Thanks, James. Have a great week, everyone. (laughs) We'll talk to you all next Tuesday. We love you. Bye-bye. The end. If you'd like to support the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast, well, you can do that by hopping on over to our Patreon page and becoming a patron. We have all the recipes from our Vegan Kitchen series up there, and we'll be adding some patron-only episodes in the near future. So thank you for supporting us at whatever level that you choose, and thank you again for listening to Compassion and Cucumbers podcast.